Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Dave Kaloran, and I would like to welcome you to tonight's seminar, which is going to cover the November LSAT, which just happened two days ago, and general law school admissions, which uh, will include a number of topics, including the cycle that we're going through right now, the use of the LSAT, splitters, all sorts of different topics like that. But one of the things I want to first do is introduce you to everybody who is in the room tonight and kind of explain exactly how we're going to work this and how we're going to answer questions and, and kind of move through the various topics that we'd like to discuss. So with me from PowerScore is my colleague, John Denning, who many of you know uh, from Twitter and Reddit and all sorts of different other places. Certainly one of the world's foremost experts on the LSAT. I like to think that we're the dream team of LSAT preparation when you put the two of us in a room. He's going to be handing, handling a lot of the chat tonight. And the chat is occurring in the lower left-hand side of your screen. So when you have questions or anything, comments, you can throw them in there, John. And, and of course, some of the other uh, folks that are present here tonight will try to answer those and help you out. And joining us tonight are our very special guests from Spivey Consulting Group, and uh, that is a the trio of all stars. And that would be Mike Spivey, who founded uh, Spivey and has worked at uh, such law schools as Vanderbilt and uh, Washington University in St. Louis. And joining him are Karen Buttonbaum and Derek Meeker. And Karen has held a number of positions at Harvard Law School and was the director of admissions there, if I recall correctly. And Derek was the dean of admissions at uh, the University of Pennsylvania Law School. So uh, luminaries in the world of knowledge about law school admissions and how to get in and, and really what you need to do. And we're really excited to have them here and to have them share their knowledge with all of us. And I think when you put the five of us together, it's kind of like an all-star lineup of LSAT admissions knowledge. So. Hopefully, we'll be able to give you guys some really good information tonight and uh, answer any burning questions that you might have as well. So I mentioned the chat window that is in the lower left-hand corner. If you look in the uh, upper left-hand corner, you can see the list of moderators at the top. And right now I'm speaking. There's a little microphone next to my name. Anybody who is speaking, you can look up there and see who it is uh, from the microphone that is there. So if it's not clear, because we're going to be passing the mic around tonight as we answer various questions. So with that kind of covered, let's go ahead and actually get into, I think, what is the most logical starting point, which is the November LSAT that just happened two days ago. And I know many of you are here to hear a little bit more about that and to kind of like hear what our thoughts were on it. So... Let's take a look first off at the actual content on that test. And then I'm, after I go through this, I'm going to talk a little bit about the difficulty of the exam itself, as well as the scaling that we might see, a little bit about the score release and so forth. The first thing that we have here is you can see the real LSAT logic games that were on this exam. So hopefully at this point, you are well aware of what experimental section that you had and which scored sections that you had. But if not, this will hopefully clear that up for you. And you can see that the four games involved a doctor being scheduled, uh, lecturers at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m. Uh, on Thursday and Friday, and then a mining operation game, which I know many of you recall fondly at this moment, and then finally paintings being sold at an auction. And the first thing I'll say about this, and just so everybody understands what we can and cannot say, I can only talk generally about the test. Um, LSAC and the rules they have do not allow us to go into very specific detail. We have a lot of detail about this exam, but we can't go into answer choices or the exact number of flaw questions or what have you. So we'll only talk about it generally. But the first thing that was noticeable about this game section was there was a ton of linearity on it and a little bit of grouping. And if you were in our crystal ball seminar for the November LSAT just about two weeks ago, one of the things that we said there was these LSATs are so concentrated on linearity and grouping that you have to be really good at dealing with those. So hopefully you took that to heart and really locked in on those two concepts because they went after them on this particular test. Now, the game that everybody was talking about afterwards was this third game, the mining operation game. And if you really played it kind of as safe and maybe as smart as possible, uh, I know a number of really good students who got to that game and were like, I think I can do this, but I don't know if I'm going to enjoy doing it or if it's going to be that fun. And so they skipped over to the fourth game. 
and then came back to the third game. And I think in retrospect, that was probably a pretty good choice, especially because so many people thought this game was extremely difficult. Interestingly enough, though, there is a very small subset of people who thought it was rather easy. And I think part of the reason is the way that game set up and the way they talked about the rules and the relationship, it was not completely standard. And if you're looking for a comparison game, go back to the June 2010 LSAT and take a look at the Stone Mulch game, a game that I think if you know what you're doing is actually extraordinarily easy. But for a lot of people, the rules just seemed weird. They didn't seem fixed. It had it felt like a pattern element, but this was really a linear game at its heart. And when we see it here in December, we'll obviously break it down uh, in much more detail. But that is a game that also had a weird month set up. And I saw way too many comments from people who are like, I got my months mixed up. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. If that is causing you problems on the LSAT, we, get, we got to stop and learn our months first and foremost, because that is the last thing that you should have to be worrying about during the test, whether you know September comes before October or after it. Um, but if that did happen to you, don't be too upset because that's the kind of thing that happens under pressure. Things that are easy to you on a day-to-day -day basis all of a sudden are far more difficult when the pressure is on. And there was actually a great quote by Nick Saban that uh, kind of reflects this idea. And he had put down a two by four on the ground and he said to his team, could you walk across this? And I think it was like eight feet long. And everybody was like, yeah, we could walk across it, coach. And he said, now I'm going to put it a thousand feet in the air. Can you walk across it? And of course, a lot of people are like a little more scared. And he's like, it's the same two by four. It's the same exact thing. It's just that the situation has changed. Focus on the two by four. Don't worry about the situation. Same kind of thing here. So if you had some struggles with this game or maybe it knocked you out and you feel like you're coming back in January, take that idea to heart and think about how that might affect you next time and how you can avoid having it be a problem. Now, the game section overall, I would classify as probably in the middle. That mining game gave enough people difficulty that it certainly wasn't classified as easy. And if you're gonna tip it to the side of harder or easier, maybe that game alone puts it more on the hard side, but overall, not a terrible section. Even if you had trouble with that one game, hopefully you did pretty well on the first two and then were able to get something done in the fourth as well. Now, when we move to reading comprehension, I think the overall opinion was that this was a really favorable section. Um, this was a section that was used very recently. In fact, both of the sections that you're looking at on the page have been used as Sabbath exams uh, sections within the last year. The Logic Games was used as the December 2017 Sabbath test. And this reading comprehension passage was used uh, as the experimental from the February 2018 Sabbath test. So a couple different sections that are floating around out here that have actually appeared relatively recently as experimentals. Now, of course, Sabbath test takers cannot take the regular LSAT. They're kind of like once they give up that option, they're not allowed to go back. So there's not a crossover in audiences and you can see them pre-testing it to a certain extent. It comes out as an experimental way in the far past, then they use it on a test like an international exam or a Sabbath exam, then they use it on a big kind of like domestic Canadian exam. So the cycle is getting shorter and shorter. And those of you who've been in the crystal ball seminars that we've done relatively recently know that we've started to predict certain LSATs. This is kind of why we're able to do it because we can see what they are doing. Now, the good news about this reading comprehension section was that it wasn't bad. Um, certainly, I heard a few complaints about this musicals passage, but the Indus River Valley Civilization passage was pretty interesting. Um, the comparative, I know there was a few tough questions there, and obviously anything that says science, Big Bang Theory, multiverse, and, so, and things like that is going to trouble a few people. But most people walked out of the test feeling like reading comprehension was doable. So... This probably then skews the scale towards a little bit on the tighter side. So you got your mining game, it's kind of loosen the scale up. You've got the reading comp section, probably going to tighten it up a little bit. But for 50% of the tests and two really easy to identify sections, this wasn't bad. So that takes us to the next section or sections, as it were, which are the logical reasoning sections. So. In these two, these are not divided in section one or section two. All right, that's the first thing I want to 
have as a takeaway. It's not like LR1 is on the left-hand side and LR2 is on the right-hand side. This is a collection of real question topics. And the reason we put it like this is so that if you're uncertain which section you had that was experimental, you could look at this and it might help you out. The one thing I can tell you is that this was the first question in one of the sections, the Bonobus or the Monkeys question, and, or Bonobos, whatever it is. And then the England Gulf Stream question was the first in another section. So those are the two real sections that you had. And you had some pretty tough questions in here. Uh, I've heard a lot of complaints about different questions, but the oysters question, everybody's been complaining about that. This internet analogy to the brain, certainly a question that I've had more than a few students tell me they did not like at all. Uh, Andy Warhol's Brillo pad uh, installation, also not like the happiest art that people had ever viewed in their lives. So as you look at this, though, it's the thing that's tough is to know exactly how difficult these questions were. When I look back on the September 2018 LSAT, and I know that many of you took that test, I think to myself, where was the real difficulty? And in that test, a lot of it came from the logical reasoning sections. I thought they were very sly. Uh, the word somebody used to me was slippery. And I thought that is a really good example uh, or good description of it. I'm not sure this section or these two sections were as tricky as the September LSAT. But then the problem with that is I also don't know. Because when it really is tricky, people miss that it's that tricky. So how the difficulty of this section, these two sections, actually plays out will probably largely determine where the scale actually comes in. A lot of people thought this was reasonable. Some people said it wasn't as hard as the September. So we'll have to see in December when they actually release the scale. The one thing I will tell you, though, is that there were lots of flaw questions. There were lots of assumption questions. The exact kind of things that we've been talking about in our recent seminars where we're predicting what's going to be on this test. For our purposes, at least, this looks like a really standard LSAT. There was nothing that was brutally difficult. There was no like Eileen Gray lacquer passage uh, from September 2016 or anything as hard as the virus game from September 2016 which was a terrible test in, in those two sections. But that tells me that the scaling is probably somewhere in the middle. And so let's talk a little bit about that idea as well, because I think for a lot of people after the LSAT, they think to themselves, okay, that was interesting. What's the scale going to be like? What did other people think of the difficulty? And it's been really mixed on this. I've seen people say it was really easy. I've seen people say it was incredibly hard. And you expect that after any given LSAT. I think this one's in the middle. And when we talk about scaling, one of the things that we actually do is we relate the scales on a 170 level. How many questions can you miss to get a 170? Now, on this particular test, if you weren't aware of it, what we have predicted is a scale of minus 11. And it's an interesting thing. Over time, uh, I've proven to be fairly good at figuring out what the scale is. I'm usually right on the money or off by one, and I can accept that. This is, this is not an easy science. It's a little bit of kind of guessing and a little bit of magic, too. This one has gotten me more conflicted than most other exams, to be honest with you, because as I look at that minus 11, there are pieces of information that I have that suggest that it might be minus 10. So... It's always possible that we're way off. And I always tell people, I hope I am incredibly wrong and it is like minus 18 for a 170. But as the case may be, we're usually a little bit closer than that. I think it's either minus 10 or minus 11. And it's really like a 51 slash 49% breakdown of these two ideas. I don't know. Let's put it this way. If it comes in as minus 10, my response is going to be like, ah, I should have should have gone with minus 10. I've, I've thought about flipping the switch over to minus 10. Now, when we get to minus 12, minus 13, minus 14, those are scales that are very loose. That's what we kind of uh, combine with a really difficult LSAT. I don't see that level of difficulty here. Um, I also don't see this test being so easy that it's, say, minus 8 or minus 9. So if I was in Las Vegas, and it's a place I like to go a lot, I would walk up to the LSAT betting table, and I'd put my money on minus 10 or minus 11. I'd go with minus 11 more often than not, but it could easily be minus 10. It's right in there. 
One of the things that actually affects this idea, though, is the number of questions. And again, for those of you who took the test, especially if you had three logical reasoning sections, it gets tough to figure this out. But there were 100 questions on this exam. So we know the games had 23. We know the reading comp had 27. The two LRs that were scored had 25 questions each. The third section, and there were several, there were really multiple experimentals. Some people had a third section that was 25 LR. Some of them had 26 LR. Uh, that 26 LR was not scored from all uh, apparent reports that we're getting. So when you break this down and you really look at it, that 100 questions usually takes an extra question off the top. So if you're thinking it was minus 12, with 100 questions, it's probably more like minus 11. This has also kind of helped me think that it might be minus 10, and, and it's, you know, it's really like 10.5 is where we're at mentally. But you got to choose a number, so I've gone with minus 11. I'm hoping that it is looser because that is better for you as test takers. So as we said before in the past, the December LSATs have had a scale average of minus 12, but this one only has 100 questions. The prior December test had an average of 101, so you take that question off. Minus 11 probably makes sense. This seems to be in line with where we're at. So last point I'll make about this November LSAT is when are we getting the scores? Because obviously that is a huge consideration. And now that you've taken the test, it's really like the rest of this is just talk. You're like, I want to see the test. I want to see my scores. I want to know what's going on. The stated score release date is December 8th of this year. And as many of you know, in the past, they used to release scores early. And I've been asked a couple of times already, you think they're going to do that? The answer is an emphatic no. <laughs> I do not see them releasing early. Uh, there's a long story behind that, but they made a statement earlier this year where they said, we're going to try to release on the date that we say we release. So I believe it'll be December 8th. For those of you who want to set a timer, the last several releases have been at 9 a.m., give or take a few minutes, Eastern time. So I'm expecting on December 8th, which I believe is a Saturday, at around 8.57, 8.58, we're going to start to see scores coming out. You'll get gray icons the night before at midnight, but you won't see the scores until around 9 a.m. on that morning. So that's kind of our coverage of the November test and some of the, the basic impressions that we have and certainly a very broad explanation of what we're thinking from a scaling standpoint. The second half of this seminar is really about admissions. And of course, the November LSAT's a big part of that. Everyone taking the LSAT is typically planning on applying to law school. And so I want to kind of move into that realm a little bit. And the first thing that we want to kind of get into is the admissions timeline. And since you've just taken the November LSAT, the first question that comes up is, well, where do I stand with that? And the answer is, you stand really well. If you took this test, and you are comfortable with how you performed and you feel like it's going to come out pretty well. Um, this is a great LSAT to have taken. Every school in the country accepts the results of it. And it puts you certainly relatively early in the applicant pool. So if you can apply early with what you consider to be your best score, that's the optimal scenario. So this is a perfect kind of like transition for those of you who are like, I think I'm done. I feel like I did pretty well. If you get that score on December 8th and you're satisfied with it and you feel as if it really reflects your ability, go right ahead and apply. You are in the front part of the group. You, that will really put you in good stead on a number of different uh, levels. Of course, the other side of that is what if you didn't do as well as you hope to when you already are like, uh, yeah, I'm retaking it, which is a ton of people. So if that is the case, first off, don't feel bad. And secondly, as I'm sure Mike, Karen, and Derek will, will reference at some point, it doesn't really matter these days. So the, the big question, though, that we're seeing a lot and which we were asked to address within the seminar is, well, how do schools treat the January and March LSATs? Are they too late? The first thing I will tell you is that every school in the country will accept the results of the January LSAT. There are some schools in the top 14, namely Stanford, Michigan, and Cornell, that would really, really like you to take the November LSAT. But if you take the January LSAT, they have stated to us that they will consider those scores. So I think as time goes on, they'll loosen that up and just be like, yeah, we'll accept it. But law schools have a vested interest in getting applications in as early as possible. 
And so pushing those deadlines and certainly what they tell students uh, towards the early part is very much to their benefit and something that they want to get out publicly. But we're posting a link right now that shows the top 100 law school admissions deadlines. And you can kind of see which LSAT they'll take. And some of them, like Georgetown, have said, we'll take it all the way to July if we still have spots available. So I've always had the idea that as you take these tests, you are really doing a two-part process. You're taking the LSAT and trying to do it as well as possible. And then you're trying to optimize the experience that you have in terms of applying. So even March as an LSAT to take is something that a lot of schools will accept within the top 100. So now one more question here on this slide, and this is a question that I'm going to really, I'm going to let Mike uh, spy the address, but it's an interesting question because he and I have talked about this on multiple occasions outside, you know, preparing for this seminar or anything like that. It's one of our most, I would say, frequently discussed ideas. And that is, if you can retake January and improve your score, is it worth it? So I know Mike has some thoughts about that. Mike, I'm happy to pass it over to you, buddy. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everyone. If, if someone can say hi in the room, uh, they'll let me know that you guys can hear me. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm in a law school right now. I am in a suit at a law school. So this is your life in, this will be your OCI period. Your on camp OCI stands for on-campus interviewing. You, you all in a year in a little bit will be in the exact situation that I'm in. It's not very exciting to me. I've been here since 7 a.m. Um, let me briefly elaborate on something Dave said. Uh, Dave and John provide you all with a link, I believe, about um, which schools take which LSATs. And just to fine point how late you can apply, almost every single school law school will not only take your March te tests, but they'll take your summer tests if, if you need to. Two years ago, I had someone call me who had just received his June LSAT score back, and he scored a 177. And he said, can you help me get into Harvard next year? And I said, I can help you get into Harvard this year. And he said, no, they, it says on their website they don't take applications past March. Well, sure enough, Harvard took his application and admitted him. Schools will almost always make room for a strong candidate. So even if the schools right now are saying that they will only take a January or they'll only take a March, the vast majority of those, I can only think of one off the top of my head, USC, that's really hard line about not taking scores after March. It's in their best interest if you do well, which segues really nicely into the January score. This is what I would do having um, admissions been my entire adult career and, and almost a, an, an adult obsession of mine for the last 20 years, knowing what I know, if I had a dream school and I was one above their LSAT already, I for sure would not take the January test. I would submit. If I was at their LSAT, I would probably submit too, but I would plan on taking in January because keep in mind, most of these schools are going to have a target median that's plus one of what their current median is. So I would submit because it's, particularly if your GPA is in the ballpark, if your GPA is exceptionally low, um, it's highly unlikely they're going to deny you. They very well like, likely might hold on to you, in which case you're taking the January LSAT anyways. If you're substantially below the median GPA and not substantially above the median LSAT, or if you're just below the LSAT and have a decent GPA or a GPA right around their median, then 100% take the January LSAT. Up in, in 19 of the last 20 cycles, scoring plus one on the LSAT in January would have been worth waiting uh, September to January to take that test. Only a plus one for most people. Again, keep these medians in mind. In only one cycle, which was last cycle, did it hurt people to wait till January and probably would have been better if they had applied earlier with a plus one. That's not going to happen this cycle. If you need to hit the median, take the January LSAT. Thanks, Dave, for handing it off. 
Hi, everyone. This is Karen Buttonbaum. Um, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about retaking because there, you don't know what your score is. We know when the scores are going to be coming out. And I know a lot of you are, are thinking about retaking already. Um, and, you know, what Mike says is, you know, obviously very true. Uh, retaking is always a good idea if you think you didn't do, do well. Um, you know, how do schools look at multiple LSAT scores? It really depends on um, so many different things, but it's the high score is the one that matters. There are very few guarantees in admissions, and one of those guarantees is that no matter how many times you take the test, the school will report the highest score. Bottom line, that's the one guarantee that I can give you, is that the school will report the highest score to the ABA. And so every time you see a median, every time you see some a school talking about their medians, it is always the high score. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you should be taking it, you know, as many times because there's no official cap anymore. Um, but for the majority of people who just have to take it again or take it a third time, it's really not a big deal. I promise you. It's not a big deal. The schools are will say that, you know, the party line is that, uh, they average scores. And this is something that is held over from many years ago when the schools had to report the average. And there are plenty of people, I know Mike, Derek, and I all worked in admissions uh, during this time when we had to report the average score. And LSAC will say that, still will say that the, the true score, I'm doing air quotes, you can't see me, the true score the most, the most accurate score is an average, but that is not really the case anymore with, with schools. They do care about the high score. So, so it's not to say you should take it as many times as you want to take it. So three times, four times, then you start to get into a little bit of a gray area. And this is where it's going to depend on a number of different factors. How many times you canceled? Um, cancels don't really count to a school unless you did it, you know, 16 times. Then it looks a little bit off. Uh, and chances are, if you cancel your your score that many times, there are probably some other uh, issues. Um, but if you if you take it four times and you took it, uh, you know, three or four years ago, and and that's in there, the, the if there's a gap in the, the timing, that matters. So there's a lot of information that the schools get when they get your LSAT score. The, the CAS report has a lot of information, including all the information about when you took the test, the year, um, if you had a cancel or absence score, uh, and you can always provide information as well. So if there is a reason, if, there are, if you had a series of unfortunate events over the time that you've taken the test, um, you, you, you can feel free to, to talk about that in an addendum. And we'll talk a little bit later on about what, what you should uh, write in an addendum uh, for other things. But the, the bottom line with addenda is to keep it brief. Um, don't make a lot of excuses. You don't want to make it sound um, worse than what they're looking at on the CAS report. So it really does... Um, the information that you can provide can, can add a little bit of background um, and some context to the number of times that you've taken a test. So I would say that there's no hard line rule on how many times you can take it before it starts to look bad. Obviously, I think it goes without saying that everyone would love for you to just take it once and be done with it. I think you would all love to just take it once and be done with it. But if you have to retake a second or third time, that's not a big deal. When you start to get into four, it does start to look into a little bit more about the timing of it, what your scores were, um, all of those things are factored in. But there are good reasons for people to take it five or six times. Um, once you get past six, I, I, I do start to question a few things, um, but there may be reasons behind that. But Mike and I, had a client in one of our very early years who took the test six times and was admitted to uh, a top a top six school. So it, it does happen. There are a lot of reasons why it does happen, but obviously it's not in anyone's plan to take it that many times. 
So how much improvement is necessary to make uh, a retake worth it? Mike answered that. One or two points can make a huge difference, uh, especially, you know, in, in this cycle, coming off of last cycle, if your school, your dream school is, um, if your score is one point below the median in the, on your dream school, then retake the test. If you know you have it in you to take it and you know that you can do better, then retake it. What I, my general advice when I talk to people who are, are thinking about retaking the test, and again, my area of expertise is, is in admissions. It is not the test. So I understand that when I tell people to retake the test, I'm not the one who has to do it. Um, but I, I think that if you feel like you've left something on the table, if you feel like you could have done better, there's really no reason not to retake it. The downside of retaking it is retaking it, and that's it. Um, so I think that, you know, one or two points that you can improve, absolutely, I do think it's worth a retake. So I think with that, I'm handing it off to one of my colleagues. I'm up, and we're, now we're talking about the cycle data, which is really interesting. Um, we predicted the last four years sort of how the cycles are going to come out on our blog, and we've been pretty lucky um, so far. And this year, what we predicted was a huge surge early on, particularly um, with some strong numbers at the top, and that that surge would quickly dissipate. And the reason why we we were able to see the surge is because we were able to see the number of people who are going to reapply re, uh, this cycle versus last cycle. The last cycle was the, was the worst cycle to get off the wait list. It wasn't the hardest cycle in the last 20 years. Karen, Derek, and I have all seen more difficult cycles. Uh, but it was the hardest cycle to get off the wait list that we've ever seen. At least I have. Karen's been doing it a, a few years longer doing emissions a few years longer. But in, in the 20 years I've been following law school emissions, last cycle was the worst for wait list. So people that applied in February, March, April were cat almost categorically shut out of the elite schools. And they many of those people had scores in the 170s. So they reapplied very early this cycle. What you've already seen so far this cycle is those top scores were, high, were very high when LSAC did their first release of data and they're already coming down. The trend, this is great news for everyone, so everyone, you know, high-five each other in the, in the chat room, but the trend right now is the number of applications are decreasing slowly. <laughs> the number, I'm watching the high-fives, the number of um, high scores are decreasing slowly, and even, it's going to continue, I expect we'll bottom out at about a 1% to 5% cycle increase by the end of, by the, end of the cycle. Um, as far as the T14s, exactly what, what we said, and um, in fact, even steeper, I had um, one of our data people take a look at the T14 schools that have already been admitting, and they're actually now admitting at a slower cost pace than they were in previous cycles, including last cycle. So right now, T14s are pumping the brakes a little because they see these these ZAS, the, the So let me, okay, let me just be frank and honest for a second and, and candid with everyone. There's a reason why I'm at a law school. Most law schools, not all, but most, are very reactive to data and they're not predictive of data. So schools see the same data you all see now. There's the link. And they react to the data. So as the applications uh, look strong, they pump the brakes. When these numbers are, are going to start coming down, schools are going to start emitting again, and you'll see a lot more waves. So you're going to see waves from all these schools, UVA, that's done a ton of admitting, Duke, uh, Ber Berkeley. You're all going to see a number of waves, particularly as schools overreact to the current data. Um, the final question is, any data on how uh, unlimited attempts are impacting scores? You know, the, 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 hopefully the cat's out of the bag that it doesn't hurt you to retake. It doesn't hurt you if your score goes down. It doesn't. They're, o they're only reporting the high score. That's the only score that gets factored in to U.S. News and World Report. So what I think is going to happen is there's still a little bit of mythology out there, including from some law schools and from LSAC, from a number of pre-law advisors, but it is mythology, that schools average. 
But I think most people get the fact that schools don't average. So they're going to keep taking the LSAT. As Karen mentioned, we had a client who had six takes. He had to have that six take because he had to be in New York City because of, of his fiance who had a job there. So he just kept taking it until he got the score um, that he needed. And then he was admitted to two of the elite New York schools. I think you're going to see a little bit of increase in number of retakes because of the people get that schools aren't averaging. That is um, all I have with the data. Derek, I believe you're up next. Hi, everyone. This is Derek Meeker. Um, very happy to be here tonight, and I'm going to talk about splitters. Um, so the question, first question is, how are splitters performing this cycle thus far, and what do you expect for the rest of the cycle? Uh, well, this is a great segue from what Mike was just talking about. Um, the, the first thing is, well, the first thing I want to say is splitters are going to get admitted. A lot of splitters are going to get admitted every cycle. I mean, the fact of the matter is law schools love splitters. They need splitters. Um, they have to admit uh, a number of them in order to hit their target median LSAT. So there are always going to be plenty of splitters getting admitted. Um, in terms of this cycle specifically, I mean, it's obviously still very early, and a lot of schools haven't even made any offers yet. But what Mike was just saying about the data is really important uh, because as we're seeing, the number of high LSAT scores is dropping this cycle. So what we expect to happen is ultimately splitters are going to fare better this cycle than they did last cycle. Um, but a key point that I want to make is patience is really important because we do expect that schools are going to take a little longer to make decisions, particularly with splitters or reverse splitters. With this uh, big spike early in applications, as Mike just talked about, schools are going to wait to see if that levels out and what that means for their pool overall. So they'll probably take longer to make decisions. We'll probably also see more wait lists for splitters and reverse splitters. Um, again, just uh, because they're going to want to wait this out and see uh, what trends develop and, um, and, uh, and just to get a better handle on, on their pull and what that's going to mean for their yield. So, um, I, I emphasize that because I think if you are a splitter and you start seeing lots of admissions offers go out and, and, and they'll start increasing from this point forward, um, you start to panic if you haven't heard. Um, but I think it's just going to be a longer cycle. And uh, so my advice is just to, to hang in there. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, I think uh, just uh, just hang in there. Um, how do splitters do in terms of receiving financial aid? Are they disadvantaged on this front? Uh, well, they're, they're disadvantaged as, as compared to applicants who have both a high LSAT and a high GPA. The scholarship process is largely driven by both LSAT and GPA. So applicants that have both um, are always going to be the ones that schools go after the most aggressively and give the most money to. Um, but that being said, uh, there are schools that focus more on LSAT score when awarding scholarships. Some that even seem to ignore GPA altogether. I've seen plenty of applicants with high LSAT scores and really low. Uh, GPA is far below the 25th percentile, still get merit scholarships. Um, so it certainly happens. It's just going to vary quite a bit from school to school. Um, I think it's just uh, the same as it is for the admissions process. When you're a splitter, it's often uh, more unpredictable and uh, in terms of how you'll fare in the admissions process and, and your decisions will tend to vary. And it's the same with the scholarship process. There will be schools that you will probably get very high scholarships from and schools that are similarly ranked that you will either get a, a, a much lower scholarship from or you might not get anything at all. Um, so it's, it's definitely going to vary. Um, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is plenty of splitters do get merit scholarships. Um, but one thing I, I also want to talk about here is um, 
softs are always going to be important in this process. I, I think it's really easy to feel like the numbers are the only thing that matters. Um, and again, they are the driving factor. Nobody den denies that. Um, but when it comes to to splitters or reverse splitters or candidates who have marginal numbers, um, schools are are only going to admit a certain percentage of those applicants, obviously. So who gets admitted, and perhaps more to the to this question, who gets scholarships within that group, is often based on soft factors. So as a splitter, the more you're able to distinguish yourself via your resume, your work, and your life experience, uh, your essays, basically putting together a polished application across the board, the better your chances are not only for admission, but potentially for a scholarship or for a higher scholarship than someone with similar numbers but less compelling SOFs. Um, so the next question, if you are just barely under a school's GPA 25th, will an LSAT above the 75th give you a fair shot at admission or not? What about having a median LSAT? Um, yeah, absolutely. It, look, just being at median LSAT means that you have something the school wants, something the school needs. Uh, if you're above 75th percentile, uh, yeah, even better. I mean, it looks good, but the fact of the matter is, if you look at schools, uh, median LSAT and 75th percentile, 75th percentile, I would venture to say that most schools median and 70, 75th are separated by only one or two points. Um, so uh, at most schools, there's not a huge difference there. Um, so my point is, I, I don't think you need to, I, I don't think uh, overemphasizing or worrying about the 75th percentile or, or how far above 75th you are versus how far below 25th percentile is, is all that important. The median is what matters most to schools. That's the number that uh, drives the rankings. So, uh, so, so yes, I mean, certainly, if, whether you're above median, above 75th percentile, if you're in that range, you're going to have a fair shot at admission uh, if your LSAT is, is below 25th. Um, uh, you know, and, and just to emphasize the point even more, uh, the way I, I would look at it is if, if, some, if, if I'm at a school where my target median is 165 and I have someone with a 166 or a 167 and another candidate with a 165, both have a similar GP, a GPA, which is below 25th percentile. If the 165 puts together a more compelling application and has stronger SOFs, I'd be more inclined to admit that person because that, that their being at the median gives me, still gives me what I need. The 75th percentile doesn't necessarily do anything more um, in terms of improving my, my admission statistics. Uh, so, uh, so, so yeah, I, I mean, just keep that in mind. And again, just uh, to emphasize the point, um, this, is, this is where SOFs really matter for, for splitters because you can really um, use those other factors to distinguish yourself. And I think it goes back to Karen now. Yes, thank you, Derek. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about essays. Um, so the first question is what high, high value items do people most often fail to emphasize or communicate in their personal statements and essays? This is, there isn't one thing. Um, what I can tell you is what makes, a, you know, some things that make a really good essay. Because it is a personal statement, it is personal by nature. And so what you have to say about yourself is going to vary tremendously from person to person. And I think, you know, some people are thinking, well, you know, I don't have that many things that are interesting about me. I never started an orphanage anywhere. I haven't done anything that's really made an impact. I'm boring. Well, the reality is that you're not boring to us when we read your applications because we haven't met you yet. So when you think about it in those terms, think about things that show your personality. So who are you as an individual? What's your personality? So a good essay has a couple of characteristics that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about. So one, I think showing your personality is, is a good thing. If you are a funny person by nature, 
then your essay, it's okay to be humorous in your essay. I mean, it's not a stand-up routine, and this isn't your, you know, the best time to try out comedy if you're not really naturally funny. But if it's in your personality to be funny, then I think that showing your personality in your in your personal statement makes a lot of sense, or your essays in general. It doesn't have to necessarily be a personal statement. Um, I think the a, a really strong essay tells the reader something about you, a uh, personal characteristic or a quality. So, for example, let's say that this quality about you or this characteristic about you is that you're a problem solver. You really like to to work at problems and solve problems. And I use that as an example because most people who are applying to law school, they tend to be problem solvers. This is something that, that you know, you're drawn to law school because you like to solve problems. It's basically what most lawyers do. Um, take them apart, put them back together. So you're not gonna tell the, the reader, you know, I'm a problem solver. You're gonna write a story and tell a story about a, a problem that you solved. So you're not necessarily focusing on the skill that you have, but the characteristics that you have that make you who you are. And I think that not focusing on the skills that you have is important. I think telling a story about yourself and giving some, some information about you is what's really important. And I think that's what people fail to emphasize. What most people end up doing is talking about the skills that they've acquired that will make them a strong lawyer. Um, and that's not necessarily what you you need to be emphasizing in your in your essays. Um, there's also a couple of other factors that I think are are overlooked sometimes. There's the likability factor. What you're really looking for at the end of your essay is the person reading it to say, "Oh, I like this person. I would like to have them join our class." And that's the that's what you're looking for. So the tone, the content, all of those things are really critical to getting that person to, at the end of the day, say that, they, that they're interested in having you join the class. Um, and the tone is really important. You don't, if you're telling a story that tells about a struggle, um, don't, enjoy, don't join the, ask the reader to join you in the pity party. Um, think about the tone, less woe is me. Um, okay, we'll move on to, to the why X statement. So a lot of schools, adding a, a why statement, I think, is a really good option for a lot of schools. Not all schools care to read them, but as a general rule of thumb, if a school asks for one, you should do one. My, uh, my, the majority of my admissions career was at Harvard. Um, you don't need a why X for, for Harvard uh, at the application stage. I'll just let you know that. Um, everyone wants to go to Harvard, so it's not really standing out saying that you want to go to Harvard. Um, I'm sorry if that sounded snobby, but that's just, that was how it was when I was reading applications. It didn't really sway me in any particular way to, to read a why statement. At the application stage, down the road and wait list, that's a different story. So, but what do schools want to see in a, a why statement? Um, they want to know that you genuinely thought about the school and not just read their materials. There are so many essays that are out there at law schools that are regurgitating materials that the person reading it has written for their website or their application materials. So it's not a laundry list of things. What you want to do in a why statement is connect yourself to the school in some way. Tell them a little bit more about yourself. Um, you don't have to tell the school about themselves. They know, they know about their programs. Why are those programs? Why is this school something that's important to you? So personalize it if you can. If you visited the school, absolutely include that in the statement. If you know somebody who went to the school and have talked to them about it in a positive way, absolutely include that conversation in the statement. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to personalize the why statement so that you can um, that you can really connect yourself to the school. But again, I think the key here is don't do a laundry list of things. Um, you can pick a few things and talk about why that you connect to them. And if there is a reason that you need to be in, this, in a certain location, absolutely let them know. If there's a reason that you need to be at a certain school because of one thing or another, you should let them know that. But it is, you know, an academic program is, is why you're going to law school in the first place. So that should be a part of it as well. So the why statements, um, again, I think really is just 
giving the reader a little bit more about you as much as you can and connecting it to the school. So that's the way I see a why statement. Um, what's the best structure for writing addenda or run-ins with the law or other problems? So the best structure and approach really is just very straightforward. Um, if you had a speeding ticket and some schools will ask for it, some schools don't care about it, absolutely read the, 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 um, the questions that you're being asked to answer and answer them appropriately. If, if it's three speeding tickets, um, you're, you're okay. You're not going to be denied admission because you have a lead foot. Um, there are things that are a little bit more serious. If it's one or two things that you've done that are, you know, useful indiscretions or just really poor decisions, that's usually not going to make a decision, not going to impact the decision of your application. But if it shows a pattern of poor decisions or bad behavior, then that's something that you, you know, is a little bit rises to a different level. But what you want to do is just talk about it um, very matter of factly, you know, um, in June of 2016, I was pulled over for speeding uh, as I was driving home from work. I received a ticket and I paid the fine. And that's about it. That's all you really need to know. Um, you know, you don't have to say I've learned my lesson. I, I will not speed ever again. Um, you just got caught. I think we've all had, we've all been driving over the speed limit at some time. The same thing is true for, you know, um, underage drinking in school. If it's just one thing that you did and you had to, um, write something, a uh, reflection piece as your punishment, just talk about that. Um, there really isn't, uh, any, you don't need to go into too much detail. Again, it's going to be very highly individualistic in, depending on what your uh, circumstances are and what you have to say. But for little things in terms of, you know, just minor things, just state the facts. And I think that's, that should do it. I think, um, I don't know who's up next. Is it Derek or is it Mike? Yes. Sorry. I was, <laughs> I got caught up in questions on the sidebar there. Uh, application outcomes. How long does it typically take for schools to make decisions? What's the latest they'll decide? Um, no one's going to like the answer to this question. <laughs> um, Anywhere from a couple of days to seven months, um, quite honestly, um, as, as we've already seen, there are schools that will make a decision within a couple of days after an applicant submitting and, and the application going complete. Um, that is uh, definitely the exception to the rule, um, but it certainly has happened and is happening. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've seen plenty of applicants uh, submit their applications in September and they don't hear back from the school until April. Um, and, and April is usually the latest that they uh, will make, that they'll decide. Um, so it's, it really varies wildly from, from school to school. I think that many schools uh, try to at least give somewhat of a range. Um, if, if you press me and ask, well, in your experience, what is the average? Um, I would say probably between four and 12 weeks, uh, which I, I know is still a, a pretty broad range, but um, but I, I think that that's, that's, again, that's just the, the nature of, of, the, of, of the process. I mean, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into this. I mean, one of, one of the biggest factors that, that affects timing is, is just uh, what an individual application looks like or what the profile is like. Um, as I said earlier, we expect that decisions will, it will, uh, will, will take longer for people who are splitters or, um, or, or, or uh, have marginal numbers. Um, so, so it's really going to vary, um, but I think that uh, four to 10 or four to 12 weeks is probably about the average span. Um, so then the question becomes, well, if you haven't heard back, um, should you write a letter of continued interest? Um, 
That's a tricky question. Uh, so if, if you haven't heard back, uh, I, I think the first thing is you just you want to check to see if the school has provided any information as to what its timeline is, either in uh, either posted on their, their website in their uh, FAQ section or sometimes in the confirmation correspondence that they send. Uh, confirming that your application has been received or is complete, they sometimes will give a range. I mean, again, it's a pretty broad one, but but that's the first thing I would do is I would certainly look for any information around that, and I certainly wouldn't contact them or or write a letter of interest if uh, you know if they if they say it it, it typically takes four to twelve weeks uh, for a decision. If twelve weeks haven't passed, then I certainly would not be contacting them or writing a letter of continued interest. Uh, so that's the first thing. Um, and I think uh, it, it, it's just to some extent you just have to use your, your judgment here. Um, schools operate on their own timeline and I think the, the higher up the chain you go, the more selective the school is, um, you know, the more liberty they can take and I think the less likely writing to them is, is going to make a difference and um, actually could work against you because it will employ them. So. Uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors to consider, um, but if uh, you know if, if four months have passed and uh, and and it, that seems to be beyond the, the the general time frame that you've given, I think that it's it's certainly okay to to send something. Um, the other thing is if you're going to do it, you should certainly have a good reason for for writing. Um, certainly if if you're still in school. Um, be it undergraduate or graduate school, if new grades are coming in um, or, or you receive some type of significant honor or award or you get you change jobs or get a promotion or something like that, then um, those are good reasons to do so. Um, but, uh, but generally speaking, um, I tend to, to lean toward um, not sending anything um, in uh, pending the initial decision. Um, but that brings us to, well, what, what if you're waitlisted? Should you write a letter of continued interest? Absolutely. Um, uh, schools tend to, to put uh, quite a few people on the waitlist. They, 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 um, they at least initially will, will carry a, a large waitlist. And the reason for that is simply because some people will, will just choose not to be on the wait list, and as time goes on, many people will just uh, will, 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 will fall, fall off. So they need to have a, a robust wait list um, should they need to admit from it later. Um, so w when the time comes for them to review the wait list, which usually happens in May, there's some variation there, but the earliest is typically May, um, the first thing they will do is look at the people on the wait list, look to see who has not submitted a letter of interest or who has not updated their file. And those are usually the first people to get cut uh, because in their mind that means that you're, you're not interested. Um, so if you are interested in a school um, at which you are waitlisted, then, uh, then absolutely you, you need to, to stay in touch. Um, and uh, how many should you write? Um, I, I think it's the general rule of thumb is um, uh, after you've written, so after you get your initial wait list and you send a letter of interest, um, I think from that point forward, I, I would just wait until um, after the school. So you send an initial letter of interest and then after the school's initial deposit deadline, usually those are around eight, between April 1st and May 1st. After that initial deadline, from that point forward, if you're still on the wait list, about once a month is a good rule of thumb or in response to a school's correspondence. So if, uh, so uh, many schools will send updates every now and then to say, here's what's happening with our wait list. This is what we are expecting. I think that's also um, is usually a good time to then respond with, um, with some, uh, to, to let them know that you're still interested. Um, letter of continued interest tips. Uh, uh, so, so several things that I would say. Um, the first thing that I, I would say with regard to this is um, there, there are several factors to think about. Um, one is doing your due diligence. Um, second uh, would be 
updates. Uh, third would be the why part of it, the why why your law school and and the why me part. Um, so let's just talk for a minute about due diligence. Uh, what I mean by that is, if if you're on the wait list um, of, and and you are really interested in, in getting admitted to the school, um, of course you you want to be doing whatever you can to get off the wait list. But you also have to think about. Uh, if you get an admission offer from the wait list, uh, you're not going to have the opportunity to go to admitted student events, uh, and you're going to have to make a decision much quicker. So what I mean by due diligence is making sure that you use the time while you're on the wait list to learn as much as you can about the school um, so that you can make an informed decision quickly should you get an offer uh, in the summer off the wait list. And the reason why I start, I started with due diligence is because doing your due diligence not only will help you make a more informed decision, but it will also help you write a much more compelling letter of interest. So doing due diligence means reaching out to students, uh, current students at the school uh, or, or alumni, uh, find a way to get connected with them um, if you don't happen to know any, um, there are, uh, you know, I, I would just say reach out to as many people in your network as you can and find a way to connect with people who are at the school. Visit the school if you can. Um, uh, sit in on a class uh, if you can. Take a tour. I mean, do, do all of the things that you can do to learn as much as you can and to connect with people who are at the school so that you, when you write your letter of interest, you can you can incorporate these details into the letter, um, what you learned by talking to this person or this faculty member or this alum, um, and, uh, and, and what you love about the city that the school is in. Um, so that's the due diligence piece. Um, the other uh, points for letters of interest, again, any updates, if you have new grades, if you are uh, if, if you've changed jobs or done a promotion, even if you're still in the same job, just, you know, an update on what you're working on. Are you, what types of projects are you doing? Um, and then the other piece, of course, the most important is what's motivating you to go to law school? Uh, what are your goals and why is that school the best fit for you? Why is it that you want to be? They're very important. Um, to that point, uh, many schools, of course, allow you as part of the admissions process to write a, a Y X law school essay. So uh, for those that don't have that as part of the application, this would be your opportunity to essentially do a Y X uh, essay as part of your letter of interest. On the other hand, if you did already write a, a Y X law school with your initial application, then uh, then use the letter of interest to reiterate some of the points um, that, that you talked about in the why essay. It's basically your opportunity to remind them of who you are, why you want to be at that school, and what you, uh, what you will add, what you are going to bring and contribute as a member of the community. And I think with that, it goes to Mike to talk about scholarships. Okay, so this is... Um... I would almost argue this is exciting for me because we so rarely talk about scholarships publicly. And there's a reason why we don't, which is as follows. 20 years ago, when the, when the three of us who have been yammering for the last hour, uh, Derek and Karen and I um, started admissions, there was uh, almost all remission. The way in, in admissions, you refer to scholarships as remission because the school's not really giving you money unless it's like a Dillard which is a scholarship plus a stipend, the school is remissing how much you have to pay. And when we started admissions, all the remiss almost all the remission came in need-based. And then U.S. News and World Report really took off and got competitive, and schools got more competitive because of it. And there was, lo and behold, the scholarship arms race. For a while, the scholarship arms race was so out of hand Schools are so new to doing it that schools weren't very good at controlling how much they offer. They weren't. They didn't have negotiation experience. Now, because the scholarship on rate, uh, the scholarship on arms race has gone on for ten plus years, schools have very much refined their negotiation tactics. And because they've refined them, they change them when applicants get clever. Your application class, you all in this chat room, 
will be the most informed applicant class to ever apply to law school. Pat yourself on the shoulders. Every year, the um, applicants get, the consumer audience gets more informed with the kind of links that are being posted on Reddit, law school transparency, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to give you give you all. I'm going to answer these three questions we were asked about scholarships, and it, this is rare. We 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 really don't. We blog about almost everything under the sun, including my dog and my running ability. But we rarely blog about scholarship negotiation because we don't want law schools to see the advice we're giving. Um, and if there's any law school of my former colleagues in law school missions in the chat room, hey folks, I won't give I won't say everything. How much of a disadvantage are you at if you're uh, for getting scholarships later in the cycle. Well, here's how scholarships work. The school will have $3 million to actually spend. So they'll offer anywhere between, generally speaking, 9 to 15, even 18 million, right? Because they're getting a lot of that money back because it, if you're offering large scholarships to people, they're probably above both your medians. And the data would tell us is more likely they're not going to go to your school, but rather a higher rank school. So the dean says to the dean of admissions, we've, we've had these conversations, Karen, Derek, and I, all right, here's $3 million. You know, use your data, offer $9 million, and schools will start offering that. So that's a lot of money. They're offering three to five, even sometimes six, seven, eight times as much as they have. So... Scholarships generally are stable as far as numbers are concerned from November all the way to January, I'd say January and February. You're not at risk of getting less scholarship money. Sometime around, for most cycles, around late January or February, schools start seeing that $3 million that they actually have get near that scary $9 million mark. And that's when you're in charge of admissions, that's a scary thing to be six million dollars over committed. If, if somehow you yielded and matriculated all those people, you'd probably be fired. You, you, the, the school would be out six million dollars and would be begging Central University for a one-time gift. It doesn't happen like that, but it's still scary. So then what you do is you see this long period of much more reserved scholarship offers, February to June or maybe May, but then the school loses so much. Keep in mind, over the summer, the school is losing people off other people's wait lists. If Harvard takes 100 people off their wait list, then, you know, UVA, Penn maybe, those schools are going to be losing a, a, a large number of people that had been given huge scholarships to Harvard, for example, and the school is getting the money back. Here's what's cool for everyone. If you're under that $3 million that you were given that year to give out scholarship, you never get it back. It is, if you're the dean of admissions, it is in no advantage to you to come in under $3 million. You always want to spend exactly how much you're given because it doesn't carry over to the next year. So what you see then, and someone asked about people getting scholarship money off the wait list, it's not as common, but it does happen late cycle. But what you see then is you see scholarship increases come July and August because schools will all of a sudden have a lot of money back. So basically, early is good, but I, timing is not the most critical part of the scholarship process. Numbers are. Uh, the second question, how hard can I push when negotiating scholarships? Um, the number one mistake people make, from my experience having done this, is they don't ask a second time. Right? You, you, schools have thousands of cases of experience in negotiating scholarships, and you have zero experience. It's one of the reasons my, our firm exists uh, today is because it's something we've done hundreds upon hundreds of times. And unfortunately, most applicants have no experience negotiating, particularly in, in this. The number one mistake is people leave money on the table. The school has more money if you were to ask politely a few more times, but the applicant feels like they're pushing, so they don't ask politely. The number two mistake <laughs> that people make is they ask too aggressively. So the best advice I could give you about scholarship negotiating is, one, you don't want to be the first person to negotiate. That really sort of gets eye, eye rolls from schools. If a school gives you a scholarship in December and January 1, you're asking for more, uh, and they're still giving up their first round of offers, they, they're, they might hold it against you. So you, all, you would almost want to wait and look at 
uh, Reddit or Law School Life or our blog, for example, and see when people are starting to negotiate and make sure you're not the first person that's aggressively negotiating. Also, just always, every year we see people who probably could have gotten a 20, 40, 60, even $80,000 increase in their scholarships because of their numbers. We hear stories from our colleagues in admissions that they got a $0 increase because they were playing junior negotiator and trying to be sort of a jerk about how valuable they are, right? So don't be overly aggressive. If you don't give me more money, I'm 100% not going to your law school. Because admissions is really interesting. You would, even during the recession of applications, you, you could always just go find another person to admit and to fill that class seat than admit someone who's being a jerk to you. So if, the best way I would put it is, if you politely ask several times and space those out for more scholarship money, particularly if you're looking around and seeing that more money is being given out, it is very likely you'll get more scholarship money. That's scholarship negotiation at its core. Ask politely, ask a few more times, and you're probably going to get more money if you've been admitted. Um, we're using offers from other schools to uh, help with the negotiation. The answer is yes, but here's something that's kind of interesting that you have, you all, most of you all haven't seen yet. They're actually going to ask you to provide those. So you don't have to aggressively say, by the way, uh, Duke, UVA gave me a full scholarship and you only gave me 40000 because actually Duke's going to ask you to provide that information. They're going to ask you to scan your scholarship letters from other schools. It'll take care of itself. To answer the second part of the question, how similar must the schools be in terms of rankings or location? That's a, whoever asked that question, that is a wonderful question. When I was at Vanderbilt Law School, we felt rather threatened when Emory would give someone a full scholarship and we hadn't given them any amount of money, right? We were 16 or 17. Emory was 22 or 23. We were in the same region. So we very well could lose someone who had a full scholarship at Emory if we weren't giving them any money. So we would probably want to withhold, want to hold on to them. We've already admitted them. It's in no, none of our interests will lose them. So yeah, we would probably give them ten, fifteen thousand dollars If Vandy, if, when I was at Vandy, just to use the same example, if we had someone who just got into Miami Law School, or Georgia Southern, and they had a full ride in the stipend, we didn't think there was any chance or very little chance we were going to lose them to those schools. So the rankings did matter. If the school was more than 10 or 15 places behind us, we weren't really threatened by them. The hilarious story I like to tell is one of Derek's hires when he was a pen, is a, she's still there. Her name is uh, Randy Garnick. Derek will have a fond memory, many fond memories of her. She's a wonderful person. She used to always laugh at me because I would, I would be offering – some of Derek's admits at Penn and her admits at Penn, full scholarships to come in, to Vanderbilt, and she would always laugh and say, they're never going to choose Vanderbilt over Penn with your full scholarship, which would then make me even like want to offer them more money just to prove Randy wrong. So, sorry, Derek. Um, and sometimes we would get those people, but not very often, because they would they, they didn't see it as a good return on, on their investment to drop that far. So I would say if you were, if the school was 5, 10, spots behind in the rankings, you can 100% leverage their higher money into getting more money at the school you really want to go to. Um, I mean, ended at that, this is more disclosive than we usually are about scholarship negotiation. I hope that, I hope everyone this was helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. We've come to the end of the session here. That was the questions that we had solicited over the last two weeks or so and, and kind of grouped them into some topics that we thought would be really interesting and give us an opportunity to kind of go through this. So the first thing I want to mention is that tomorrow morning you will get a email from PowerScore that has a link to the recorded version of this session. And then later on in the day, we'll actually post it publicly uh, so anybody can grab it on YouTube and Vimeo after we uh, closed caption it and do a couple other things to it. So you will be able to get access to this. We will send it to you. You'll be able to get to the links that were posted and so forth. What we're going to do now is we're actually going to close the session down in terms of like the live talking and uh, that aspect. But we are going to stick around for a little bit and take questions on chat. 
uh, address interesting things that come up. So as we close it out here, I want to first off uh, on behalf of John and myself say thank you to everybody for being here. We hope that the discussion of the November LSAT was something that you found useful and you know if you were uncertain about that test maybe gave you a little bit uh, better footing and then uh, on the other side for Mike Karen and Derek uh, we can't thank you enough for being here that was um, fascinating if these kinds of things fascinate you and they they do for me and so I really enjoyed listening to what you guys had to say some really interesting tips that were in there in fact, probably so much that I think a lot of it might have just gone past uh, some people when you're trying to listen to everything. So if you get a chance, maybe re-listen to this and uh, hear some of the tips that they gave on things, uh, you know, from essays to scholarships to what have you. As Mike said at the end there, they don't always talk about these things publicly, so we kind of got lucky here tonight uh, as well. So. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. If you're not familiar with Spivey Consulting Group, in my opinion, they are the best at what they do in terms of admissions assistance, and their success is a testament to that. Uh, on the other side, John and I strongly believe that we're the best at LSAT preparation. So as I said before, I feel like this is a dream combination of Spivey and PowerScore together, and I um, hope you guys enjoyed it, and thank you so much, everyone, for being here.